Hello, my name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 121 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Happy Friday indeed, Jennifer. Um, today's topic is um, tips for an effective environmental monitoring program. Uh, a key word there is effective. Um, lots of questions on this on the dis IFSQN discussion forum. So uh, a very uh, timely and probably overdue topic. And that's with uh, Dr. Douglas L. Marshall from Eurofins Food Safety Systems. I'll be introducing you to uh, Douglas shortly. Um, just to say, obviously, some of you are already familiar with the chat bar. Type in the sidebar. Uh, let us know where you're um, joining us from today. Uh, say hello, get to know each other. Uh, don't type your questions uh, until the end when we have the Q&A or else they'll just get lost. Um, it is being recorded today as always. And we will follow up to all registrants with an email with the slide deck and the recording later. You will see in the sidebar um, the um, that's Shell Hartzer from Orkin uh, Pest Control. And we've got another free webinar next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it's a one hour webinar and that's how rodents are threatening your food safety procedures. So uh, another topic we've not actually covered pest control. So that will be good if you can join us next Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern, um, click the register now button, uh, it'll open a new window and you can register directly. Um, the Food Safety Fridays webinar program is sponsored, as you know, our, our kind sponsors help to support this, bring uh, this sort of free education to you, get your certificate of attendance uh, throughout the year. And uh, now I'm going to play the uh, sponsors uh, advertisements. We're we'll back in a couple of minutes. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Okay, thanks to our kind sponsors. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce you to today's guest presenter, Dr. Douglas L. Marshall. Doug, are you there? 
<sighs> yes, how is everyone today from beautiful Chicago, Illinois? Uh, nice to have you with us, and you're, you're calling, you've joined us from a, <laughs> a hotel room in Chicago today, Doug, yeah? It could be worse. Could be worse, yeah, we did discuss that. We could be down a coal mine. Uh, right, okay, let's get the uh, slides ready, and I'll be back for the Q&A later, uh, but for now, I'll hand you over to Doug. Well, hello, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to be able to spend an hour or so with everyone here talking about a topic that's very dear to my heart, um, and that's uh, environmental monitoring. Uh, in the U.S., this is a required program as part of the Food Safety um, Preventive Control Program, uh, particularly for certain kinds of foods and processes. So for those of you unfamiliar with Eurofins, just a quick uh, introduction to who we are. We're the uh, global leader in food, environmental, pharmaceutical uh, testing, and uh, I happen to be doing this on behalf of Eurofins Food Safety Systems, which is our consulting, training, and auditing group here in uh, North America. So I want to put the context of environmental monitoring in terms of how it might relate to some of the other food safety management programs that you're using. So there are really three main pillars that hold up the table of food safety. So that's good manufacturing practices, good sanitation, and good HACCP programs and uh, preventive controls. And environmental monitoring is a tool that you can use to be able to assess the effectiveness of these other programs. So again, here are some other examples. Um, you can look at food label review and controls if you have issues with allergen control. Uh, certainly you are uh, advised to gather data points to inform you on the effectiveness of your programs. And obviously auditing is another component that most people rely on to have another third party set of eyes looking at your uh, practices and procedures to ensure that they're um, meeting best industry practices. So in terms of uh, food safety, and that's going to be the focus of my talk today, we've had uh, many issues worldwide where environmental pathogens have been able to find access to foods. Sometimes these foods undergo a processing kill step to eliminate pathogens, but if the product is exposed to the environment Prior to final package closure, you can get recontamination. And I just want to give one example that occurred many, many years ago where environmental contamination became uh, uh, kind of an important issue, at least for those of us in North America. And this was a company called Basic Food Flavor. It was a very large producer of an ingredient called hydrolyzed vegetable protein. It's an ingredient used as a flavor enhancer. And um, there was a gigantic recall because this ingredient was used in all kinds of different products. And um, the company continued to sell contaminated products 30 days after first notification of salmonella. And I just want to address the, uh, the item down at the bottom. This is the company's management strategy during this um, uh, recall event. And it was, and I quote, we just wanted it to go away. And the purpose of today's talk is to try and get you away from um, crossing your fingers, looking up in the sky, and praying that an event won't happen to you. So we certainly don't want to be in a position where we look at a production lot and we have to guess whether it's um, meeting specifications and is not going to make a consumer ill or is not going to uh, have a performance issue with short shelf life. So why would you want to test for pathogens and allergens? Well, obviously, it's for brand protection and liability reduction. In many regulatory jurisdictions, there is an obligation that you do um, testing. Certainly, to validate all your preventive controls, you would want to have data points that tell you whether those um, procedures are actually able to achieve an outcome you desire. Validating the effectiveness of your environmental control programs validating purchase specifications by you or your customers, and then for compliance and outbreak investigations. Should you decide that the cost of testing is more than your company P&L can bear, this is the risk profile that you're going to inherit. You have the potential for injuring or killing your customer. 
believe me, this is not a successful long-term marketing strategy for your brand. Obviously, there's intrinsic and extrinsic costs associated with recalls, damage brand reputation, and in the U.S. with FISMA, you now can have personal liability um, for criminal offenses and civil offenses should a consumer become sick. So why would you want to do environmental monitoring? Again, depending on the regulatory jurisdiction, there's a regulatory perspective, there are customer expectations. In other words, it's a cost of doing business to sell your product. But most importantly, I would say it should be your expectations. I want to point out a couple of really important things. So environmental monitoring is an essential component for microbial tr control in food manufacturing. But environmental monitoring is not a control measure. It is simply an assessment tool. So you need to be doing all the other things that you're doing in your preventive controls. And you're using environmental monitoring to give you data points that tells you whether they're working or not. In the U.S., we passed a new law several years ago, and our government said that environmental monitoring program is important to verify the effectiveness of your pathogen controls and processes where food is exposed to the potential um, pathogen in the environment. So again, this is why you're using environmental monitoring primarily as a tool to measure the effectiveness of your sanitation programs. So in this case, this is a uh, Frankfurter manufacturing site. On the left, the picture shows um, Frankfurters coming out of a cooking oven. So that smokehouse is an effective kill step, but those Frankfurters then are exposed to the manufacturing environment on the right before final package closure. So if you have the potential for cross-contaminating that product, then you need to be doing environmental monitoring for pathogens during that exposure period. So what does a good environmental monitoring program look like? Well, first and foremost, you need a baseline sanitation program where you're using a search and destroy mission. So you are attempting to identify harbored sites for pathogens, and if allergen cross-contact is a potential issue, you should also be looking for allergens. And then have a sanitation program that can uh, eliminate or remove these contaminants. Then you have a testing program that assesses the effectiveness of that sanitation program. You evaluate the results of these data points and you do a root cause analysis when you have an out of specification result. And then you take corrective actions that again are based on that root cause analysis. So when you set up an environmental monitoring program, it's very, very important that you identify what the goals of that program are. Again, most of the time, the goals are to uh, find pathogens or allergens in the environment before they can contaminate a product. So again, seek and destroy. You can also use environmental monitoring to assess the effectiveness of cleaning, sanitation, employee hygienic practices, and maybe many other good manufacturing practices that you're doing. Where are you going to collect these data points? Uh, first and foremost, uh, we recommend using a zone approach. There are many um, philosophies on how many zones you need. The simplest one would be a two-zone approach where you have surfaces in the manufacturing site where you have direct product contact versus other surfaces where there is no direct product contact. So that would be a two-zone um, concept. Later on in my talk, I'll give you an example of a four-zone concept. So uh, I know people that have uh, anywhere from two to six zones. Um, choose the zone approach that is appropriate for your needs. So which pathogens are important to me? Uh, this is a picture of a drying unit operation of peppers. Um, I'm not going to mention the country. But I'll just have you look at that picture. And I want you just to shout out amongst your colleagues on the line here today. How many opportunities do you see for cross-contamination during this uh, unit operation in this food manufacturing um, facility? So again, any pathogen could potentially be on this product as a result of how this product is being currently processed. But we can simplify our thought process and focus only on trying to control two pathogens, and I'll tell you the reason why. So the first one is salmonella. That's usually the target organism for environmental monitoring 
of surfaces in a facility where it's a low moisture food manufacturing environment and a low moisture food product. And the rationale is, is that salmonella can be a persistent survivor in a low moisture food manufacturing environment. So it can exist in a state of quiescent animation for many, many days, many weeks in those facilities. So if you are controlling salmonella in those facilities, you are do, also doing a great job controlling some of the other gram-negative pathogens in that facility, such as E. coli, Shigella, Campylobacter, et cetera. On the other hand, Listeria monocytogenes is usually the target pathogen for monitoring uh, in manufacturing sites where you have a high moisture food and a high moisture manufacturing environment. So does this mean that salmonella can never be a problem in a high moisture environment? Of course it, it doesn't. Does this also with the corollarias, does it mean that listeria is not a problem in a low moisture environment? And the answer is yes, it could be a persistent contaminant there. But if you can control these two pathogens, then the odds are very good you're controlling the other pathogens. So where do you want to control? Um, you really want to put your focus efforts on the primary microbial control area. And I'll just define this. It's an area subsequent to uh, a lethality step, if you happen to have one in your process, and then prior to the final package closure step. So if you have processes that kill salmonella or listeria in a lethality step, or then you're really focusing on that narrow area where product is exposed to that manufacturing environment. If you do not have a kill step in your process, then odds are good the entire manufacturing facility becomes your primary control area. So hopefully this gives you some uh, examples on the scope of your environmental monitoring is highly dependent on your processing scheme. Temperature and humidity monitoring are relevant simply because microbes can survive and persist in manufacturing environments uh, and potentially grow when you have high moisture and high humidity. So there are certain times of the year and certain um, climatic conditions where this can be an elevated risk for your facility. Under those circumstances, you should do uh, a bit more environmental monitoring to make sure you don't have an out of control situation. So a written environmental monitoring plan should have the following uh, bullet items in your plan. So you can consider these as, as header items in your plan. You should be able to identify the sampling sites. Obviously, you should have your objectives in there. And uh, I recommend using a facility grid. And this facility grid can uh, you just take your um, square footage of your plant and plot out the various grids that should, can include uh, direct product contact surfaces, as well as non-contact surfaces. And you should assign a random number to each grid and then run those random numbers through a random number generator to determine which grid you're gonna sample on a particular sampling day. However, you should also um, do selective sampling of sites that you know are potential harbored sites. So we call these hot areas that through your testing history, you know there's a reasonable likelihood that the pathogen's going to be there and you don't want to ignore those sites when you're doing your routine monitoring. You should specify the frequency of your sampling, the number of samples you're going to take, the procedure you're going to use, the test method you're going to use, the laboratory that's conducting the testing. And then also in this uh, plan, you should put corrective actions in how you do a root cause and, and how you maybe do preventive actions. So uh, one of the big questions I get is where should I be testing? And again, uh, your sampling priorities should be based on a zone approach. Obviously your highest risk surfaces are gonna be your direct contact surfaces because that's where your odds of getting a pathogen onto the product or an allergen onto the product are greatest. And that should be where you put the bulk of your effort. You should focus on non-product contact surfaces in the pro uh, post-lethality area for primarily for pathogens. Now this is one that is a bitter pill for me because I'm basically giving you a recommendation that says don't test for pathogens on your direct product contact surfaces. So that means I'm asking you all to take a stupid pill today and ignore your highest risk surfaces. And one of the reasons why people make this recommendation is if you find a pathogen on those surfaces 
and it's a ready to eat product, then um, you've now created a recall uh, situation for your company. If you are manufacturing products that are not ready to eat, then again, it stands to reason that there's a reasonable likelihood you will find uh, pathogens on those surfaces. And so if you're routinely testing those surfaces, then do you really want to put yourself in a recall situation on a regular basis? So um, I would argue that our thinking about this is changing, and I certainly advise people if you have a kill step and a process and you have great sanitation, then it is prudent that you should probably do periodic testing of pathogen on those direct product contact surfaces. So if you're not going to do that and you're going to take the stupid pill every day when you do this, then you need to be monitoring for something on these direct contact surfaces. And one approach is to start testing for um, indicators that somehow are correlated to the uh, prevalence of pathogens on your environmental surfaces. So you should rotate between uh, these grids. We don't recommend compositing or pooling of samples to save money on testing. Because if you find an out-of-spec sample, a uh, composite sample, now you have to remediate a whole bunch of areas in which those composite samples were taken. So you might be saving um, a penny on your testing, but spending a dollar on remediation. Allergen testing, on the other hand, you should be focusing on direct product contact surfaces because the odds of getting an allergen from a floor onto a product are, are not, uh, not that good. So testing your direct product contact surfaces for allergens is advised. So I mentioned the idea of hot spots, and there will be uh, places in your facilities where you have the potential for biofilm formation of, of spoilage organisms, indicator organisms, or pathogens. And your sanitation program is key to controlling these biofilm areas. This is an example of a listeria biofilm that's put on a, a pristine um, piece of stainless steel that's never been used. Uh, the cells immediately attached, and after running the stainless steel under running water for 30 minutes, you can still see these organisms are attached. So the microbes, when they get on a surface, they attach through van der Waals forces and hydrophobic interactions, and they're very, very difficult to remove. That's why you need to use sanitation chemicals with detergents to help lift them off the surfaces and kill them with sanitizers after cleaning. So why are you sampling and how will you use these results? You should trend results, particularly if it's um, quantitative indicator testing. In other words, look at the data. The data will tell you whether your sanitation controls are working. You should establish effective action and alert limits. You should initiate investigations when you have an out-of-spec trend. And then you should implement effective corrective actions in response to these excursions. So where should you test? Again, I already mentioned this. But you need to be front-loading your environmental program uh, with testing dollars so that you can identify your hotspots and you can identify higher-risk areas. If you're only doing a handful of samples a week or a month, it's going to be very, very challenging for you to have good understanding of where these microbes are hiding uh, in your facility and on your equipment. So I mentioned I'll bring up the concept of zoning real quick. So this is an example of a four-zone con concept. And in this example, zone one is your highest risk area. These are areas where product directly contacts uh, an environmental surface. And uh, zone two would be areas in close proximity to zone one. So if you have a conveyor belt, then the conveyor belt would be zone one. The uh, supporting architecture of that conveyor belt, uh, so the um, uh, motors, the support legs, the floor, those would all be zone two, so they're in close proximity. The floors, the walls, the floor drains further away would be zone three. And then areas outside of the primary production room uh, such as um, employee welfare areas, offices, warehousing, and so forth, those would be zone four. So that's an example of hygienic zoning. People ask me all the time, how often should I be doing testing? The only answer I can give you is it varies depending on the, the risk of your product and your process. 
how much brand risk you're willing to take, and the size of your operation. So I'll give you an example. Uh, a small seasonal honey producer where it's a low risk product with a low history of, of issues. I've got one that's doing quarterly testing and they only send in five samples a quarter. Compare that with a large uh, processed meat manufacturer. They're sending in 75 listeria samples a day. So again, where do you fit in that spectrum? Only you know, but uh, I'll just give you some, some basic recommendations. It's up to you to decide what is fit for your purpose. So again, zone one, these are direct product contact surfaces. You can look at uh, the examples uh, that I have listed here. It's by no means complete. So weekly or daily, depending on risk. Um, if you have, um, Items in close proximity, so I, you know, we know that um, uh, Newton defined gravity as anything that, that falls from a tree will fall into the ground. Well, you look at your overhead structures over zone one surfaces. So if you have overhead structures, light fixtures, catwalks, any microbes that are up there, they can fall, they can get on those direct product contact surfaces. So you should also look up and see what's up there. Um, we also see um, Drippage from uh, condensates on pipes and metal structures is another big problem. Zone two, because your risk is lower, maybe you could consider doing less frequent testing. These are some examples of zone two surfaces. Again, zone three, uh, lower risk. Uh, for listeria control, people tend to focus on floor drains only because floor drains are difficult to clean and get sanitary. Listeria lives there. So it's a good target, but you have to ask yourself, you know, are there any processes that I'm doing in my facility where I could transmit Listeria from a floor drain onto a zone one surfaces? And if the answer is yes, then floor drain control is a big deal. And the primary way that happens is using high pressure hoses during cleaning and sanitation. And if you blast that floor drain, then you can create an aerosol getting onto zone one surfaces. Some more examples, you'll get the slide deck, so I'm not gonna go into these in any detail. Zone four, because these are outside of the primary production facility, you would wanna do it more infrequently. And my recommendation on doing these kinds of uh, surfaces, use these to uh, inform yourself and your employees on GMPs and personal hygienic practices. If you're trying to reinforce hand washing, then collecting samples from a hand wash station is a great way to be able to show folks that, hey, we find high microbial counts here, we occasionally find pathogens in, in restroom areas, we'll wash your hands. So uh, there are, in my uh, career, uh, these are some places that I found salmonella and, and my colleagues have found salmonella in food manufacturing areas. Again, I'm not gonna dwell on these, but you can just look through these at your leisure when you get the slide deck and think about, do I have any of these in my facility? If I do, when's the last time I did environmental testing to see if I could find salmonella in those locations? Uh, some more areas. Uh, one thing that, that I've seen in uh, foodborne outbreaks is uh, a lot of physical plant defects can lead to outbreaks. And leaky roofs is one of the big ones. So hanging a tarp under a roof leak or putting a bucket down to collect the rainwater is not an effective corrective action. Uh, what you're doing is you're basically taking salmonella that's on the roof of your facility. And the reason why it got up there is because you have birds roosting and they're pooping on the roof and that salmonella in the bird feces is finding its way into the facility. So you really need to do an effective correction act, corrective action and that's fixing the roof leak. A lot of the items we used in cleaning and sanitation also can harbor salmonella. I know that seems a little odd, but these are frequent areas that I find pathogens when I do uh, a recall or an outbreak investigation. As you look at the tools that are designed to eliminate these pathogens from the facility, and frequently they're contaminated. Outside, uh, again, the normal habitat for salmonella is in the um, fecal uh, tract of animals, both warm and cold-blooded animals. So if your employees are doing lots of things outside and then coming back in the facility, 
I guarantee you they're bringing salmonella into the facility. Listeria, many uh, areas are similar. In this case, listeria can actually multiply and grow in your wet uh, food processing environment, and it doesn't take much. You know, the gap between two pieces of equipment, a bolt hole, a recessed area, these are all good locations to establish a biofilm of listeria. You can look through some of those. How often should you be doing testing? Again, that's a, a question that's difficult for me to answer because every facility has different risk profile. But you really need data to guide you in ter terms of doing an effective um, analysis of how frequently we should test. You should look at the history and trends of your past test results. You should look at the features of the plant. If you've got high-risk features, you should be doing more testing of those features. What is the type of product you're manufacturing and the volume that you're producing? What does your plant layout look like and what does your plant flow look like? You might look to your uh, regulatory agencies for advice. So in the United States, we have um, the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service regulates uh, meat and poultry. They can't answer this question any better than I can. Um, so they say it depends on the establishment features such as plant layout. Sample sites should be selected randomly and some sites may be designated for sampling on a regular basis based on the hazard analysis. So again, our, our government agency can't tell you how many samples to take, how frequently you should sample and what you should be testing for. But I will try and answer that question. Again, I gave this to you just a couple of seconds ago in, in the uh, zone examples. But this is based on um, just a summary of best industry practices. Is this, is this my personal recommendation for you? The answer is absolutely not. When you get started, uh, this is one calculation you could do that could give you a gut check on whether or not you're taking the large, large enough number of samples. This is what the pharmaceutical industry used to do when they were qualifying a processing room for manufacturing pharmaceuticals. They don't do this anymore because it wasn't based on risk, but it's just simply an easy thing to do. So you take the square meters of your processing room and you take the square root of that number and that gives you um, uh, the number of samples you might want to start with. And so in this example, you've got a, uh, 24, um, a 225 square meter facility. You take the square root of that and it comes up with a magic number of 15. Can you do more or fewer than this number? Of course you can, but at least this gives you a starting point if you're starting your environmental monitoring plan. I want to talk about investigative sampling. What we've talked about before is more routine uh, recommendations. But if you have an out-of-spec result, or if you have a breach in the facility, or if you have um, identified poor personal hygienic practices or poor sanitation practices, you need to ramp up the number of samples you're taking because you could have an out-of-control situation that your routine screening uh, volume is potentially going to miss. So these are some examples where I would strongly advise you do uh, aggressive investigative sampling. And uh, you can look at that list. And, and again, the last one is whenever you find an out-of-spec result, you need to do vector sampling around that location to see how widespread it is and to see how, how far you have to do remediation. What kinds of samples should you be taking? Well, uh, a lot of people say, I do end product testing, therefore I don't need to do environmental monitoring. Because if there's a problem with sanitation, I'll pick that up in my uh, finished product test. Well, that may or may not be true. Uh, all it takes is one salmonella to potentially make someone sick. And so the odds of finding one salmonella when you pull, pull a 25 gram sample for end product testing is very low, even though the production lot could be contaminated. So that's really not the best kind of sample to take. But if you've got a uh, enclosed, uh, clean in place system, then maybe you could take the first product sample, uh, product run that comes through that system as a proxy for everything that's coming through the system, 
or you could take the water that comes off the final rinse water as a proxy for all these direct product contact surfaces. But again, these are some examples. Don't forget that if air is blowing uh, through the facility, that that air can be a vector for pathogens, transmitting them onto exposed product or onto direct product contact surfaces. Method selection and data collection. Uh, you know, use equipment that is fit for purpose. So there are many vendors of these. Um, if you're using a third-party laboratory, um, many of these laboratories will be happy to make recommendations on sampling tools that are fit for purpose. So just make sure you're doing that. And make sure the people collecting the samples have been trained in, in aseptic sample te technique. You don't want the people collecting the samples to cross-contaminate the sample. Uh, key points on uh, sampling, I recommend getting those specimens to your performing laboratory within 24 hours. Uh, chill the samples after collection, particularly if you're doing uh, enumerations, because if you collect uh, food residue, water, and microbes, those microbes can grow on those swabs and, and sponges if they're not properly refrigerated. If you know you're collecting um, potential antimicrobial residues on these sampling devices, make sure that those devices have uh, inactivating buffers for those sanitizers. Also, many products have either natural or added antimicrobial agents. So if those agents are present in the uh, samples, they can inactivate microbes too. So make sure you understand the impact of these antimicrobials when you're collecting the samples. In terms of data interpretation and management, uh, you're going to be getting uh, lots of data, and you have to be able to answer the question, what do all these numbers mean? Make sure you're keeping records, have performance targets, establish a baseline, do trend tracking, establish an action team, and, and an action plan. So you're going to get quantitative and qualitative um, information. So qualitative is just simply the presence or absence of your analyte, usually pathogens or allergens. And then quantitative would be your indicator. So it could be the level of ATP on a surface, the level of protein on a surface, you know, a pass or a fail, or actually relative light units, or a quantitation. So you need to know what the limits of detection are and the limits of quantification of each of these methods. Make sure you have an understanding on how to interpret the analytical results. Have a great relationship with your laboratory provider, whether it's internal or external, so that they can help you interpret what these numbers mean. Um, in your um, EMP plan, make sure that you have uh, record keeping of this data. So uh, this would include uh, these items. And again, I recommend that you put on those a place to put the result value in. Also go ahead and have the action limits and corrective actions so that the individual who has to make a decision on these analytical results knows what the next step is. They don't have to go hunt to find another document to figure out what to do. This is an example where a quantitative indicator is um, appropriately correlated with the presence of a pathogen. So make sure when you're using an indicator that it has some relevance to the pathogen that you're really trying to control. So in this case, on the left column, the indicator is total enterobacteriaceae counts grouped across different process, uh, or excuse me, different population sizes. Uh, and it correlates with the prevalence rate of salmonella uh, in these samples. So if you have no ability to correlate your indicator with pathogens, then I would question whether that indicator is really useful for controlling pathogens. It might be useful to tell you something about sanitation, but it may be uh, completely irrelevant that tells you anything about whether you're controlling pathogens. So in this example, you're going from uh, you know, a population of uh, less than 1%, as soon as that indicator counts gets above 100, then that um, 
popula or then the uh, pathogen prevalence rate jumps to about 10 percent. So this demonstrates when your your process gets out of control. This is uh, an example of a dry milk uh, processing plant. So uh, here are some examples of uh, some performance targets you may consider. This is an example only. Again, this is not my personal recommendation for your products or process. You can use uh, lower um, uh, target levels if that's appropriate for your facility. If you are uh, using high populations of probiotics or starter cultures, then maybe these levels are inappropriate for you because you've got lots of these organisms on these surfaces. What you're doing then on the x-axis, it's unlabeled, so this is just simply population size uh, uh, on the y-axis. The x-axis is just time and, again, not labeled. And what you're really attempting to do is to use these quantitative indicators to give you an early warning. So you set your, your target level. If you don't exceed it, everything is going well. Once you get a breach of that, it gives you an early warning and you need to start asking questions. If it exceeds your unacceptable level, now you have to do a corrective action and get it back into uh, appropriate control. So this is just a visual way in which you can uh, let the data speak to you and help you make decisions. These are some uh, recommended members of your response team. A lot of times uh, quality people only have quality members or food safety members on this team. It's important to have sanitation there, production, as well as maintenance and anyone else you think is appropriate to be on this team because you're gonna need help in remediating an out of specification um, data point. What are some elements of an effective response plan? If you find a direct product contact surface that is um, found with unwanted allergen or, or with pathogens, then you should assume that your product is compromised, potentially adulterated, and you should advance to questions whether we need to recall the product if you do not have that product maintained under your control. So uh, determine what, what's going on. So you can test and hold the product Again, if you're using end product testing, does that data point actually tell you whether the product is not contaminated or not? Maybe not. It might be able to tell you how widespread the contamination event is, but you can't use that negative to uh, deny that that zone one environmental pathogen isn't real. So you can reprocess if you have a kill step, but you need to understand what happens if your kill step didn't work and you're going to reprocess product back through that kill step? You need to make sure that you can verify that the kill step was actually working. You could destroy the product. You could divert it to a customer that um, might be okay using your contaminated product. So uh, after you've done your remediation, do increased investigative monitoring around this contamination site and only return to routine sample frequency after you have three successive days of negative test results, meaning the product is back in, or the samples are back in spec. So corrective actions, make sure you block off the area that is potentially contaminated and limit access. Break down and inspect any equipment because you don't know where the organisms are coming from. Thoroughly clean, again, increase sample frequency, do vector monitoring around this known grid. And again, if your pre-op inspection fails or you get another uh, subsequent uh, out-of-spec test result, this tells you your corrective action didn't work. So make sure that uh, before you bring it back into production, you have achieved effective control. So if you find a site that routinely comes back out of spec, that tells you that your routine preventive controls aren't working. In that case, you may want to create a specific um, standard operating procedure that helps you prevent recurrence of that location. And again, if that problem is just something you cannot control, then you should consider removal, replacement, or redesign of that contaminated equipment, that contaminated floor, that contaminated wall, that contaminated drain, because that may be the only way you get uh, can get under control. 
So Simon, I have come to the end of my slide deck. I know that's a lot of information. Everybody should get the slide deck. Uh, ping me if you have any questions, and let's uh, go ahead and see what we can do with the folks who have uh, addressed the questions here. Okay, great. That's fantastic, that Doug. Um, yeah, like I say, a lot of information. So um, I'm sure when the audience watch watch the recording back and, and go through the PowerPoint slowly, there's a lot of great information to di disseminate. Uh, right, questions. Um, oh, bl blimey. Let's start with this uh, long one from uh, Derek. Can you see that? Uh, oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Uh, that seems to be the hardest thing about this program is to set limits. The generalized standard limit has been shown is 10 and 30. But it all depends on the production facility. Many aspects, say flower dust, can throw off your limits as well. That is why the pathogen specific swabs come in handy, being as it is not RTE. Oh, <laughs> it's a question. Okay. I think they've been discussing with each other. Go on, Doug. Yeah. So, so I, I guess if it's a if it's a not ready to eat um, manufacturing facility in sight, um, you're you might be in a situation where your customer is asking you to develop an environmental monitoring program, because that becomes the cost of doing business with that customer. And so, if you decide, okay, well, I have no kill step in my process. Um, how much trouble am I going to get into if I start testing for pathogen on those surfaces? And the answer is, you're probably going to get in a lot of trouble if you start looking for, for pathogens in flour. There's about a 5% prevalence rate of things like salmonella and E. coli in flour. So in that case, you're going to probably want to focus only on doing indicators and, and to be able to tell your customer that, hey, the indicator is telling me that I've got effective dry sanitation in this facility and I'm keeping my level of indicators counts at or below my spec limit, whatever that number is. So hopefully that addresses that kind of an issue with that answer. Okay, good. Uh, Raymar Richards, uh, how does this fit with PET, PET, plastic bottle production facility, dry manufacturing? Do micros survive on plastic? Yeah, um, I deal with a lot of our customers, and it's not uncommon for me, when, pr primarily when I'm doing a spoilage issue uh, study, is to look at the plastic containers and do some sampling of those containers. And it's not uncommon to find very small populations of potentially spoilage organisms. Typically don't find pathogens, so that's a good thing about this kind of manufacturing is is it's rare with that we find pathogens but occasionally we can we can find spoilage organisms on these packaging materials so you need to be able to ensure that during your manufacturing process you are limiting uh, the potential for cross-contamination through air and dust you put protective covers over the open mouths of the uh, of the bottles you put the caps in plastic bags and seal the bags up before you put them in a box so those are some of the preventative actions you can take to yeah. reduce the potential for contaminating those plastic surfaces. So the main risk is sort of yeast and molds and things like that from in, in dust and things Correct. like that. Correct. Yeah. Okie dokie. Uh, Abdel Rahman, Rahman uh, ref limits of pathogens and microbes for hand swab and surface swab references for... Okay. Well, I did put a table in uh, one of the later slides that gives you some example limits. Um, you know, and again, the best way I can tell people, if you want to know what spec limits are appropriate for your facility, do the testing, see what you can achieve. And you might want to do swabbing on a dirty surface, so dirty hands to start with. Do swabbing on a clean hand after with. And that'll tell you what that delta is that you can achieve by following your SOP. And then you can set an appropriate limit where you know it's been done successfully. And that gives you a target level to start with that's appropriate for your product and your facility. Okay. And Lorianne, if you want to begin zone one sampling, how to mitigate the risk of implicating all previously run products should you get a positive hit for a pathogen? Great question. Um, my recommendation is 
Number one, you need to be using a validated cleaning and sanitation um, SOP. And you validated it as effective in controlling the microbes that are in your facility. So if you're using a validated uh, cleaning and sanitation protocol, then you need a verification data point that says it worked on that day that you did it or at that time that you did it. So that defines a, a recall lot. Then as you're manufacturing on this surface, you take your specimen, it comes back out of spec, you only have to recall back to that last validating cleaning and sanitation step where you had a verification point that it worked. You're not gonna have to recall everything that you manufactured before then. So that's a key point on sanitation is make sure it's validated and you have a data point, an environmental monitoring data point that says that it worked when you did it. So that helps limit the scope of, of the material that you might have to recall. The other thing, if you're doing zone one testing on pathogens, it's important, do it after you've done a cleaning and sanitation step. Because if you're doing that correctly, the odds that you'll find a pathogen should be very, very remote, and the odds that you're putting yourself in a recall situation should be very, very low. Okay, uh, Kevin. Uh, what is a good risk assessment tool for raw meat manufacturing that isn't ready to eat and will be cooked prior to consumption? Well, there are many risk assessment tools. It's be kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but you could uh, consult with your local regulatory agencies, depending where you are. Um, if you want to look at uh, the US FSIS, USDA FSIS in the US, has recommendations on environmental monitoring for uh, raw meat and poultry manufacturers. So there are resources available on the web for you to, to look at. Okay, uh, Thembika, if producing canned sterilized fish, where would be my zone one? Canned sterilized fish, this is a great question because I don't think you need to do environmental monitoring. Because think about how this product is manufactured. So you're taking a, a not, ready to, or not ready to eat product, you're putting it in a hermetically sealed container, the container gets a definitive kill step, and the product in that container is never exposed to the environment after that kill step. So I would say, why bother, okay? You, you know, the kill step is while the product is in the container, I would say environmental monitoring in this case for pathogens is unnecessary as long as you can prove you've got a validated process control with your canning operation and that you've yeah. got verification data points that show that canning is, a, is effective. Mm -hmm. is that what the, only, the, only thing, the only thing that I would maybe consider is go back earlier in the process and if you've got histamine forming bacteria on, on a high risk kind of fish, so let's say tuna for example, then maybe you would wanna do environmental monitoring for histamine forming bacteria where this raw material or this cooked material ready to get put into a can is maybe exposed to these spoilage organisms and it could elevate the risk of histamine formation. Okay, um, is that what Lydia's sort of backing up? For low acid canning was told don't really need an environmental program. Correct, here's another situation yeah. where the process preventive control is acidification, okay? And that takes place inside the container. The only thing that I counsel you is, in this case, if your process is ineffective and your sanitation is poor, you could have the opportunity for mold spoilage or yeast spoilage. And so maybe you could uh, consider doing environmental monitoring for spoilage organisms, not so much pathogens. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, Amit, why do we have a zero limit for listeria in US while in some country jurisdictions there is a maximum limit for RTE products? couple of reasons. Number one, our regulators don't want to be in a position where a very small population of listeria has caused outbreaks, right? And, and we do have some recent examples where that has happened. Things like ice cream, things like frozen vegetables. The organism doesn't multiply and grow in a frozen environment 
yet that very small population level has killed people. And so our regulators and our government doesn't want to have to answer a question from the consumer. Why did you allow listeria in, in a ready-to-eat food? And, and it killed my child or it killed my grandparent. So okay. that's the reason why the U.S. has a, um, has a zero tolerance. Right. Uh, Bonnie, what test does the lab use for indicator organism? Uh, okay. Uh, our customers use potentially lots of different uh, indicator organisms. You could use an aerobic plate count. You could use listeria species as an indicator for listeria monocytogenes. You could use coliform and E. coli testing. You could do enterobacteriaceae counts. You could do yeast and mold counts. So these are all indicators. And a simple ATP test is another indicator. So there are many, many different kinds of indicators uh, for allergen testing, you could use a protein swab. So again, which indicator is appropriate for your use? You really need to consult with your laboratory and, and food safety experts to help guide you in the choice of what, an in, what indicator is appropriate for your facility and your product. Okay. Manoj, uh, if, if the trends we found there are no pathogens from the last few months, shall we increase, I think it should be decrease the frequency sure. to, uh, more months. Yeah, when you're developing your food safety plan, your best friend is past history. And you're always going to be looking at that past history to help define what your risk is. Certainly, you can use a, a spec conformance over a long history to help you define how frequently we want to, to do uh, testing. And so I just gave you examples. They're not your, my personal recommendation for frequency. If you decide that your brand risk is, is not um, high, then by all means, you could reduce your number of, of samples. But on the other hand, if you want to protect your brand, most people want to have those data points because that becomes their defense when a regulator, an auditor, or a uh, customer comes visit you and they ask, please justify why you're only doing this number of samples infrequently. How are you going to defend yourself? Yep, good point. Uh, Riaz, currently everyone is recommending testing STEC instead of coliforms and E. coli in finished products. What is your, your comments on this? Okay. Um, again, we're talking about finished product testing, so it's a little bit beyond environmental monitoring, but uh, I'll go ahead and address the question. STEX is for shigatoxin producing E. coli. So this is a group of E. coli strains that have potential to be harmful. Most E. coli uh, are, are not harmful bacteria. They are found in the environment. They're an indicator of potential fecal contamination. But if you're looking specifically for the pathogens, that's why you would look for STEX rather than looking for indicators such as coliforms or E. coli. So again, it depends on, on your risk. If you want to manage the risk of feces in your environment or in your product, then you're going to be, uh, I think, better off looking for coliforms and E. coli than for STEX because the odds of finding STEX are going to be much, much smaller than the odds of finding E. coli. Okay. Dennis Grayson, could you please talk a little about FDA Swabathon, how to handle when they show up? Okay. We have this beautiful experience in the United States called a Swabathon. This is where a regulatory body will knock on your manufacturing door and say, hey, we happen to be in the neighborhood and we want to do an inspection of your facility. And following uh, behind is, a, is an army of, uh, a small army of other inspectors coming into your facility with a collection of swabs. And they're going to be doing anywhere from, let's say, 50 to 100 to 150 tests in your facility. And, you know, there's a reason why they're there. They're not just driving by and, and they said, hey, let's stop here. There's a reason why they're stopping in your facility. They're doing an investigation and they want to find out whether or not your product is implicated in a potential outbreak, or they are trying to develop their own risk assessment database for your product and process or for similar products and process. 
So they're going to collect a gigantic number of samples, and guess what? They are looking for pathogens in your environment. So they're going to be testing the high-risk sites in your facility. So that's an example of what a FDA swabathon is like. My recommendation for you on how to handle this is don't panic. If you've got great sanitation, great GMPs, great process controls, and you've been doing environmental monitoring, you've got data supporting your, your program, then, then bring it on, right? They're going to tell you what they find, and you're going to have to respond if they find a pathogen in your facility. Hopefully they don't find it on a zone one surface, because if they do, chances are good, you're going to have to do a recall. Okay. Uh, specific to olive oils, do you know much about olive oils? Sure. Uh, packaging of olive oils, what types of pathogens likely to be tested knowing that there is no high risk area and no direct contact with the product? Okay, well, uh, field packing of olive oils. Well, I would say your processing environment is in the field, so I think there's abundant opportunity for cross-contamination. Um, so just because it's not a manufacturing site doesn't mean you have to have proper sanitation. What is your friend, however, in oil processing is that there's no moisture there, uh, hopefully. And, and because of that, microbes need moisture to multiply and grow. So if you have something like salmonella in the field, salmonella on the olives, salmonella on the equipment surfaces, it could get into the oil. Um, it could survive for a small amount of time, but it's not going to multiply and grow. So I won't say that it's zero risk, but it's it's pretty low risk. Okay. Eddie Odi, how important is it to have an environmental air program? We are services, but are getting pushback for adding environmental air. Well, if you have air handling units in the facility, that air is blowing onto direct product contact surfaces. And so you can consider that air also as a zone one surface. And if it harbors pathogens, if it harbors spoilers organisms, or if it's moving around allergen dust, then that air is a very, very important uh, potential source of environmental contaminants, and you should be testing it. Okay, O'Brien oh, Mutual, What's your opinion on the use of hand gloves and frequent hand washing? Okay, uh, this is always a fun one to discuss. My opinion is proper hand washing is an appropriate preventive control, and you can prove that by doing swabbing of people's hands before and after hand washing to be able to show the count reduction that occurs on, on indicators. So that certainly is a great way to prove that your hand wash SOP is validated, and you could do periodic verification testing of that. If you decide to use gloves, then the question I would ask in your facility, what is the purpose of that glove? Is it to protect the food or the direct contact surfaces from employee hands that presumably have already been effectively washed, or is it to protect employee hands from the manufacturing environment? And remember, too, when you wear gloves, guess what forms inside those gloves? One of my favorite environmental contaminant items, and that's called glove juice. Glove juice is the sweat and the microbes that are on your hands. If you wear a pair of gloves for an hour or two, you get glove juice in there. And when you remove those near a zone one surface, where is that aerosolized glove juice going? It could be going right directly onto product or onto product contact surfaces. So again, in, in your particular application, is glove use good or bad? I don't know. I don't like the sound of glove juice. <laughs> uh, Melanie Keel, would you be willing to again cover the reasons behind not testing food contact services? We are RTE heat treated shelf stable meat facility and follow us the recommendations for testing food contact surfaces. Yeah, again, if you decide to take Uncle Dougie's stupid pill and not test direct and not test direct product contact surfaces for pathogens, these are your highest risk surfaces. Does it make any inherent sense you would ignore those surfaces? I would say no. 
But there is uh, a group of preachers of environmental monitoring that says adamantly, don't test those surfaces for pathogens. And the rationale is twofold. Number one, if you find pathogen on those surfaces, you have to do a recall. So if we don't want to do a recall, we don't test for pathogens. So that, that's a monetary decision uh, in, in those companies' hands. Another logical way to argue not doing zone one surfaces is the logic that says when we do our equipment sanitation, we're washing from the top down. And so if we do an effective job cleaning our zone one surfaces, any pathogens that are going to be there are going to get washed down to a zone two surface or a zone three surface on the floor. And if we test for pathogens there and we find them there, that says that there's also a reasonable potential or zone one surface was contaminated or vice versa. If we don't find them on those surfaces, then that tells us that it's unlikely that the zone one surfaces have pathogens. So those are two primary logic streams that people use to argue for not doing zone one surface testing for pathogens. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Michael, Michael, if I process fruit drinks and do environmental monitoring every three months, coliforms in zone one, coliforms in zone two, and coliforms in zone three, I take a sample of each area, I'm fine. Well, of course you're fine because I've never met you and we haven't had an opportunity to discuss the risk you're taking with your current program. So let's think about that risk. So uh, fruit drinks, so it's high acid product presumably. That reduces your product risk a little bit, but we also know, I'm assuming you've got a kill step in your process. Hopefully you do. Um, so now you're really looking at that, that area between your pasteurization step and final bottle closure. Um, you're not testing for pathogens at all, and so I would ask, you know, you're, you're using coliforms as your indicator. Do you have any kind of correlation between a coliform count and the presence of pathogens? If you don't, then your inspector, your customer, your auditor, who'd come in for a friendly visit, how do you justify that you have pathogens under control with your current system? And the answer is, I don't think you, you can come to an effective uh, justification. So you might want to do a periodic pathogen test to do that. Now then, the other big question is you're doing, you know, the duration, you know, the frequency of your testing is every three months. Yes, you have a program. Yes, it's probably a low risk product. Yes, the process has a preventive control in it, but the frequency of your testing is quite wide. So if you find it out of spec, then you're going to have to recall three months worth of product. So that's how much product you have at risk. That's the recall risk you're taking by doing that wide of frequency in your testing. Okay. Brittany, what are the requirements for performing sanitation validations? Do you use inoculated validations with surrogate organisms? Okay. Um, in terms of validating your sanitation, uh, I think the recommendation that I would make is you need, you probably should do that at least once a year. Um, anytime you change equipment, change the process, change anything about your sanitation. So it could be a new uh, chemical, it could be a new vendor, it could be a new way of doing an, an SOP, then you should also revalidate uh, your sanitation. So uh, that's my recommendation on validating. Uh, you didn't mention verification, but I would argue you should verify the effectiveness of your validated sanitation protocol every time you do it because those help limit your recall uh, lot size, because you got a data point that says, we did cleaning and sanitation and this day and at this time, and it gave us the outcome we expected. Okay? And then do you do inoculated validations with surrogate organisms? Probably don't have to do this, unlike a process preventive control with a sanitation control. Ideally, you've got microbes on that surface, or you may have allergens on that surface already, before you do your cleaning program. And so all you have to do is show that your sanitation uh, protocol can effectively remove those um, uh, pathogens, remove those allergens from those surfaces. 
Uh, you're getting lots of good comments in the sidebar, Doug. Uh, um, Suji, this webinar is better and more informative than the last one that I had attended. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, seriously, you're getting lots of positive comments. Uh, Suhail, does this EMP come PRP or OPRP? Uh, I think that's... Do you understand PRP, your PRPs and OPRPs? It might be oh, I don't, I don't know, pathogen recall 000. program, not sure. No. Um, let's take this one from Christopher. Um, okay. If utilizing EB as an indicator and found out of spec greater than 100 CFU, is product considered adulterated? Okay. It really depends on whether or not um, you have a written uh, corrective action for that out of spec result that you just assume that if my indicator count is out of spec, that it's a product I don't want to put on the market because it's got elevated risk. So you as a manufacturer can, can play it in that way. Enterobacteria AC count, again, it's an indicator. It indicates the possible presence of gram-negative bacteria that share common characteristics to things like Salmonella and E. coli and Shigella, et cetera. So if you've got high indicator counts, that tells you, you your sanitation's out of control. And so you may decide to do a recall on that. You may decide to do some additional testing for pathogen on those surfaces, for pathogen in the product. But again, only you can define what your, what your next move is for an out-of-spec result. So it doesn't necessarily have to lead to a recall, but many people who have an out-of-spec result, they might want to hold that product back and do some additional testing to, to decide what to do with that lot. Uh, we've gone way over. We're on one, one hour 11, and we still nowhere near got through the questions. Uh, Hlonni Pani, an interesting question. I'm considering implementing an EMP in my facility. Of concern are primates, monkeys, which are inherently in our environment. There's not much we can do about the primates because of local regulations. How best can I make the EMP more effective? This is a fabulous question because there are more important primates in your facility than monkeys outside of your facility, and that's humans. About 20% of the people working in your facility carry salmonella in their intestinal tract. They're not symptomatic, so they're not showing signs of gastroenteritis, yet every day they come to work, they're bringing salmonella in your facility. So uh, with that kind of knowledge, then you should be having effective personal hygienic practice program that you could use environmental monitoring to prove that your controls are working. But also, if you know you have animals outside and in closer proximity to your facility, by golly, you better be testing for salmonella on the grounds outside the facility and making sure you have effective barriers to keep that salmonella that's going to be outside from getting into the facility. Okay. Um, the, the questions, they never cease to amaze me. <laughs> uh, Anna Koo, do you have a reference stroke link to find indicator versus pathogen correlation? Um, yeah, well, you, you would have to look at the, uh, the research literature to be able to, to find that. There are a lot and lot of examples where, particularly with raw materials, that, um, that people are doing indicator counts with pathogen testing counts. But the best reference for you, whoever this person is, Anna, is to do the indicator counting and the pathogen detections in your facility with your products. And that's how you can build that correlation that's appropriate for your facility. Okay, the last comment there, I think we'll have to leave it. Ivan, um, lol, lol, humans are worse than other primates. Well, hopefully uh, not the ones on this webinar today. We're, we're not, surely not, especially Doug as well, because he's highly intelligent as he's proved today on this subject that confuses a lot of people. But... I think you've uh, shed a lot of light on it and helped a lot of people today, Doug. So thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, and thanks, everyone, for joining.
yeah i hope to have you on another one uh in the near future doug okay take care okay bye bye right ladies and gents i've loaded the certificate in the sidebar um that's it uh i will be following up with an email afterwards uh with the slide deck and the recording there was a lot of information in the slides so you can look at that at your leisure uh, brilliant uh, webinar today thanks for your attendance uh, enjoy the rest of your day and have a lovely weekend hope to see you on tuesday at the uh uh, Orkin webinar about pest control. Bye-bye.